friend called Stuart Dryborough who's um, who's now a um, he's a cinematographer and he he shot the piano um, and uh, he's an amazing cinematographer and now works mainly out of New Zealand and he he came up to me sort of in the street and said look I've I've heard that song Nature and I would love to shoot it I've, you know I'd, can I do that and and so we involved him he was one of the he was one of the cinematographers on it a couple we used a couple of other different cinematographers I thought it would be really good to have a dance um, element in it and I'd been collaborating with Douglas Wright um, and uh, and I, I asked him if he was interested and he choreographed a piece with two of his dancers so it's a, I think it's the only New Zealand like, music clip that's got Douglas Wright chore choreographing on it because he I mean he will he would find and did find actually, but he, uh, the 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 process uh, of the uh, of the music clip to be full of compromises, like too compromised for him, because a pop song, you know, and uh, and he, I think he just wanted like the camera to stay still and the dancers to do their stuff so that he could you could see the whole choreography. Of course, when we cut it together, um, we we cut it up like anything. Got all the footage of seagulls and and waves crashing stuff like that and just gave it to Fay and said what can we do with this and then he uh, he was in a, in a flurry of activi activity in his normal kind of mad state in those days he was he was doing his own artwork but he was also directing ads the the song when you listen to it and, and you only hear the first little bit of it it maybe sounds like a sort of dark little story but actually the the, 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 the song's about the, the coming to the end of a bad time the song's about redemption it's about um, you know, for me, the whole payoff is the whole the ending. You know, where the where the trees turn red, and um, you know, I mean, maybe I didn't write it right, but some some people have heard that and, and sort of said, oh, it sounds a bit sort of sh bit dark, a bit Stephen King. You know, it's like, well, they're not. They're it's Auckland, Auckland in December. You know, the thing about Sally is is that I, some maybe something to do with the process, the process of um, uh, working. And working with stop frame animation is it is it is it you must you have to plan it, and you you're working away in a kind of solitary way, and you're seeing you're experimenting and seeing it grow incrementally. So, um, well, I think that that stops you getting distracted with um, <clears throat> normal clip cliches because the the normal clip cliches are uh, here we are at the chorus, you know you got to you got to come back and see the you know see the lead guitarist you know sort of swinging his hair around and and um, there's a trim, there's a sort of grinding conventionality of clip, the clip sort of language that that um, stop frame animation doesn't have, can't have any of that really. In some ways, really uh, a really terrifying process, and in other ways, because it's all virtual until the last minute. In some ways, it's really enjoyable. It's really freeing because you're not, you know, you you can at the last minute you you've just got dots on the page. So at the last minute, you could go. Oh, I'm going to change that whole cue. You know, I'm going to move that whole cue around and speed it up, slow it down. You know, do it on trombones instead of on flutes. And that's it. Was fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. I was really lucky to have um, the support of the orchestra. To have Gareth Farr, who was my orchestration assistant, who who took my orchestrations and just added bits to them. And you know, I'd say, oh, this is done. This one's done. But I've got to do the next one. Yeah. Can you? fill in that gap there, that's a little bit light in that bit, so we go I'd, I'd already worked with Tor Fraser, so we, we had and we had a good working relationship already because I'd worked with him on number two. In some ways the palette was, was a lot narrower because I knew it was going to be uh, an orchestral, entirely orchestral score. I kind of responded to the script by uh, giving Tor and uh, Chris Plummer, the editor, um, a whole bunch of music that I thought the script conjured up in, in, in my head, like not music that I'd written, but music like Michael Tippett, um, uh, Elgar, um, Vaughan Williams. Um, there's, there's a fantastic set of stuff that Benjamin Britten did as a young man. He was collaborating with, um, with T.S. Eliot and they were, they were both um, uh, working for the British Post Office. They're making these crazy little films for the for the British Post Office in the same sort of amount, same sort of time frame where Len Lai um, had, he just sort of arrived in London, and, he, and the, the, the post post office commissioned him to make these really cool scratch frame animation animation films for for the post office. It was a sort of enlightened period, briefly, 
in the, I think in the 30s. Um, and so I sort of listened to all that music and threw it at Tor. And he said, yep, yep, write something like that. That's great. Mix, mix all that up and, and write it. It's all got to be orchestral. And it's all got to sort of sound of a piece. You know, you don't, we don't suddenly want a synthesizer in there. You know, at one stage, at one stage, the the um, Matthew Metcalf, the producer, said maybe this is the kind of film that has a big song at the end. I don't know. You know, maybe it is. You know, and and I said, I don't think so. You know, showing sketches uh, to Jane Campion, the director of Angel at my table, was was a sort of incremental process of like building building it up and. You know, she would she would say um, that that cue's working, but it's 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 coming towards the audience too much. It's telling them what to feel. It's too um, too emotional. Tone down the cello or whatever. Um, with uh, with Dean Spanley, um, because it's an, or an orchestral score, you you can only hire the orchestra the orchestra for um, one session. We had actually two two three hour calls. And, that, and everything had to be finished. Mm -hmm. So basically, there's two or three months' work um, composing on manuscript, you know, in a computer program, playing the director and the editor and the producers bits and pieces um, out of the computer that um, that sort of simulate orchestras, but they sound terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so having everybody having to make that leap of faith for two or three months, and then everybody saying, you know, negotiating the each cue. Until it's right, and then you end up with this wad of scores, this huge amount of paper, and then you take it, and distribute it around the orchestra, mm. conduct them in, and bang, that's the score, and and it's all finished in in six hours. Yeah. All of that work is completely realised, and and then there's a little bit of editing, but really, you know, with an orchestra, what can you do? You can't take if there's a cymbal crash in the wrong place, you can't take it out. We had an early idea that we would we would we thought we could make um, the reason for breakfast. Which was one of our stage shows, all about two guys, two guys waking up in the morning trying to have breakfast and forgetting how. That's that's the premise of it. Um, we thought that we could make that into a, into a short film, and um, we had a whole plan for it. And we and we'd we'd worked with a director, Bill Tipfer, um, who was a mate of ours, who um, who put a lot of energy into it. Um, um, and then the more we worked on it, the more we thought, the more we thought, no, it's a stage show. Let's not adapt it. So the, one of the front lawn things was sort of slash and burn. Like don't don't recycle anything. You know, do we've done that? We'll go on and do something else. You know, and also don't keep records of anything. Don't video any shows. That's one of the terrible things. Is that we never we were superstitious about video uh, about recording stage shows. So somebody asked us a while ago to, to if we could do a like a documentary on the front lawn, and we and there's no archival stuff or very little archival stuff. So Short of having a bunch of people stroking their chins and saying, you know, they were re they were rather good. There was a show called Kaleidoscope in those days. Um, we did a deal with them where if we did an interview, a Kaleidoscope interview, sort of a special on us, where we performed part of the interview, they would then give us a bit of money, and and with that extra bit of money, we could make uh, our own little thing, which which um, ended up being walk short. And the resources that they could give us were the camera. The crew, the stock, um, and the makeup department and the wardrobe department. We thought, and we thought, oh, that's good. The wardrobe department. We could maybe play a whole lot of different characters, you know, because because that's one thing TVNZ were really good at. These you know dramas where everybody gets to, you know, um, dress up in different clothes. So we had we had uh, we had the whole wardrobe department and makeup department at our disposal. And so we wrote this thing, which was a circular story, which involved. Um, um, it involved a whole bunch of different characters that that randomly bump into each other because we were working with this 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 idea, this idea of the documentary where where somebody's walking down the street and talks straight to camera, um, which is a sort of a it, that's a convention that documentaries use all the time. You know, and walks with very heavy feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that's right. That's right. I, I think this. I think the sound. I think I went a bit over the top on the soundtrack, <laughs> frankly. I, I, just got, I, borrowed a, I borrowed a sampler and it's like, oh man, I can get sampled footsteps. And, and then I completely drove the sound mixer guy crazy by wanting to turn them up all the time.